Okay, so uh, you may recall that I indicated last time um, that we were going to be uh, discussing sensitivity analysis. And indeed, uh, during our previous class, uh, we talked about many of the basics of sensitivity. This is in the broader construct, the broader milieu of a consideration of uncertainty in agent-based models, um, uncertainty about what will be taking place. And, and last time we, we talked about sensitivity analysis as a key tool in grappling with this uncertainty, um, a tool that allows us to ask to what degree our results of an agent-based model are contingent upon are, are based on the details of our assumptions captured in that model. And broadly, that's what sensitivity analysis in all its various forms seeks to, to answer that, that question. But there's many forms of that question. There's forms of that question that relate to model structure. There's forms of that question that relate to model parameter assumptions. There's forms of that question that relate to model stochastics and uh, other more subtle matters could be brought up as well. The latent state of the model, model matters involving exogenous factors outside our control, dynamics of a world that, that we're not sure what's going to be, be playing out in, in broad terms um, regarding key uncertain factors, the economy, whether there's another wave of, 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 uh, of, of, of uh, vaccine resistant variants coming in the next few months, uh, uh, to what degree we'll see uh, governmental action that might impact uh, uh, employment uh, in order, because of desire to counteract uh, inflation. Uh, we deal with a world that's uncertain and sensitivity analysis points us towards a way of being prudent in our interpretation of a model, being humble, having humility in our interpretation of a model by recognizing um, the the contingency of these results on, on certain, uh, certain assumptions. But one of the lessons we learn from sensitivity analysis with nonlinear models is that models can exhibit profoundly different sensitivity to different parameters, number one. So you may have some parameters where you know, you're, if you have a 20% degree of uncertainty about its value, for example, it makes a huge difference for your outcomes in which you're interested, for the intervention trade-offs in which you're intervention, in which you're interested. But you may find that for other parameters, a 20% difference in, in value for that parameter will make almost no difference. In, in terms of those outcomes or those intervention, the trade-off between interventions that you're interested in, that consistently the same intervention looks better than the others, or consistently you know, you're going to be seeing um, a, a sudden rise in the occurrence of depression uh, within the population within the next four to six months. And it's just the exact timing of that that is very important. So sensitivity analysis allows us to, to zero in on that. And last time, we looked at an example, another example of nonlinearity in model outcomes, whereby model outcomes were incredibly sensitive to the value of a parameter at a certain range. So for broad ranges of that parameter value, for broad, broad ranges of it, 
the model results didn't really change much in terms of outcomes we were looking at. Um, number of people presenting per day or number of new cases of infection, number of incident cases of infection, or the, the utilization of our, of our clinics. But then there was a certain point where even a small change in that parameter really increased those numbers, all three of them. And then another broad range where the system was maxed out, we're in constant firefighting mode, where there were too many infections, too many presentations, therefore long waiting times, clinic that was too busy, and the infection perpetuated. So we actually saw there that sensitivity to parameters is not something where it's a, um, you just say, you know, uh, there's a certain elasticity, a 10% change in this parameter leads to a 1% chance in the, in the outcome. 1% change in the outcome or a 10% ch change in this parameter leads to a 50% change in the outcome. No, it, it depends on often different values of that parameter and sometimes where you are in what we'll call state space, where you are in the, the underlying state of the system. So those are some subtleties, which I didn't really emphasize last time, but I, I wanted to emphasize, you know, to make sure we didn't, Missed that point. Sensitivity is not a fixed thing in these nonlinear models. It can vary hugely over the ranges of parameter values and in, in um, state space. Okay. Um, but uh, I want to go back um, to examine some additional challenges uh, associated with sensitivity. And then today, either more or less as time allows, we're gonna talk about a very particular sort of sensitivity. A sensitivity we care a huge amount about, which concerns running the model with different assumptions associated with what if scenarios. Now these what if scenarios are sometimes designed to be examining intervention that is, things that we think could plausibly be undertaken in the world, say, to bend the curve, to, to improve the situation, to lead us to a healthier health future, to a better health future. So often they are, um, you know, interventions that could be undertaken in principle or could be considered that would improve the situation. Those may be the what if scenarios we examine. But in other cases, the what if scenarios we examine might be, might reflect what if with respect to external conditions that we don't control. And I mentioned some of them earlier, but the, the development of situations in the economy, um, weather factors involving uh, occurrences of, you know, stochastic things like arrival of new variants. Um, th these are factors that we can't expect to, um, to fully anticipate. And we may define concrete, discrete scenarios, particular scenarios designed to examine those sorts of vulnerabilities, those sorts of shocks. So, the later part of today, I'm hoping, probably just be the final 10 or 15 minutes to start talking about this issue of running the model with different scenarios, which almost invariably, with the exception of the baseline, involve examining how model results change based on certain alternative, alternative uh, posing alternative possibilities. But there, our goal is not so much typically to ask about things we, you know, big unknowns, but often we're interested um, much in things we can control, things that are under control. So we'll be coming to that, and we'll see some new models for that that we haven't previously seen.
but let's um, uh, let's switch over and and see if we can hit on some of these uh, these issues with uh, with sensitivity that we had started to to get to before. Okay, um, so uh, I noted the the varieties of of, of sensitivity um, aspects of model uncertainty. And we looked at some example models. And I'd like to call up um, one of those models. Uh, and it was this multi-clinic SIS hybrid saturation effects and lock-in version two. And it was actually a, a version of it that um, we had ended up creating in, in class. And I, I apologize if not everyone has this. It is something I did as part of class. And I I can't actually remember if I went and I posted it. I, I have a feeling I didn't. But what we had put into place for this um, scenario was a multivariate sensitivity analysis. You may recall that here we have a baseline scenario, which has certain values for each parameter. So there's a specified parameter vector. And we had sort of graduated for that from the sake of sensitivity analysis to be more savvy. We had looked at a set of, of variations. We had changed, for example, the contacts per day over a certain range in a very regular fashion. And we saw in another model with this free form mode, how we could draw those values from a distribution in something called Monte Carlo analysis. We drew them from a truncated normal, where if it was less than zero, draw from, if the draw from the normal distribution gave us something less than zero, which given the parameters was very unlikely, but possible, we use zero instead. Otherwise we use the draw from the normal distribution. Um, that was another one of the same idea of a one-way sensitivity, it's called. One way, and this is called a one-way sensitivity analysis. Sometimes it's termed a parameter sweep. We, we sweep through these parameter values to distinguish it from a, a Monte Carlo analysis. But it's a one-way. We're only doing it with respect to a single parameter. So we did it for this one, and we did it separately for the incubation um, the incubation period and days. We had one for each of them, contact rate and incubation period and days, each one went. But we recognize that, you know, changing both together might yield somewhat different outcomes. They might interact in a certain way. Maybe with high contacts per day leads to lots of spread. Maybe high a low incubation rate and lots of spread will have quite different effects than, than a, for example, a, a, a long incubation and few contacts per day. Um, so uh, in order to examine both together, we had examined a multivariate one here. There we go. Um, and this multivariate one uh, involved changing both each of them over certain ranges. The first of them going from one to 21 with step size of one, and the second one going from 0.2 to two with a step size of 0.05. And in order to do that, we had to compute here uh, the, the set of all possibilities of it. So we have all of the first times all of the second. So in the first one, uh, if it's going from one to 21, we have 21 different values. In the second one from 0.2 to two with a step size of 0.05, uh, we're gonna have, uh, I think it was 10, uh, 10 values. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, that doesn't add add up. No, it's it's more than ten. Um, in any case, uh, uh, 
it was the product of the number of each of these that we had to explore. And if we had gone to three, we would have had another dimension of, of, of uncertainty yet we could have captured um, and so on. Uh, so this ends up being expensive. Um, and uh, once we have the set of, of different parameters in which we're conducting sensitivity analysis um, uh, to you know, a large number of them, we're going to have a combinatorial explosion. If we have n distinct parameters and we each vary that we vary each of them over C possible values, maybe C is three. If three possible values, say for five parameters. So N is five, let's say C is three, meaning C three possible values. Well, we'd have three possible values for the first. If we want to enumerate how many values we have, we have three for the first and we have, that doesn't constrain at all our second one. We have three for that. So we have nine so far, three for the third we have 27, three times three times three. Three for the fourth, we have 81. And three for the fifth, we have 243. So we have C to the N. So you say is three and, and N is five, three to the fifth's power, right? And you can imagine that gets really large as N goes up and as C goes up, right? Um, if C were not, not three, but 10, we'd have 100,000 different possibilities with an N of five, right? 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, right? 100,000, 10 to the fifth, Um, And so, you know, as you're doing this, um, what you find is for larger models, models that take a while to run, it can be infeasible to really exhaustively examine all such combinations, okay? Uh, and this is a set of techniques to help us more artfully perform this sort of sensitivity analysis. Now, the example I'm giving here a little bit falls flat for two reasons. Number one, um, the as a teaching example, it's a very, very descriptively and mechanically simple model these models which we had examined are, are really not very expensive to run. Um, we could run it many, many times. And if we had, you know, 10,000 runs to perform with this model, um, even if each of them needed to be performed with 10 realizations, we could do it realistically. Um, it might take couple hours um, for a hundred thousand runs each run you know running 10 times a hundred thousand different param vectors of parameter values different different particular assumptions about parameter values for each of them running at 10 times and we have to do it a hundred thousand different parameter values well it would take a while but it, it, it might be a few hours but we could do it might well be for this model, within an hour, it, it would finish. But you know, for larger models, particularly larger agent-based models, or agent-based models where you have a lot of realizations you have to run, it really can be expensive. So, so one thing is, you know, the size of the model. But the other thing is, you know, often here we're looking at parameters that are that are conceptually continuous. Um, uh, so, so for this case, we're dealing with things like uh, the incubation period in days and the contacts per day. Those were the things that were were being varied here, and those are conceptually con continuous. But you know, sometimes we have other parameters that are um, that are are more nominal or categorical. They're they're not continuous and we actually want to learn for different values um, as we change it. Maybe it's a matter of, um, of you know, which person in the family is, um, 
is intervened upon, you know, the mother or the father or something like that, um, uh, or or uh, for a same-sex couple, uh, each each of uh, the possible guardians. These these are things which we might want to not just treat as numeric values, but but actually reflect on you know the the possible different outcomes, or maybe we're looking at different provinces in Canada and different combinations of of what if uh, scenarios involving them, and and going through. Each of them is not an exercise in just kind of running it and summarizing the results uh, across for variability across all. It really requests requires us to to kind of look at the results and interpret them. So often with sensitivity analyses, it may be worth in some circumstances considering techniques that will that will allow you to handle the large number of parameters more effectively. And there's, there's sort of three broad sets of techniques that I'm going to point to today. And the first of them is something we actually talked about last time, but um, I didn't really emphasize its scalability. And I'm gonna put that emphasis on it today. Last time I treated it as more just kind of a mechanical option for generating values we could draw it from a distribution. And it turns out that that's, that's more scalable. It allows us to simulate a broad set of inter, a broad set of possible alternative values in a more feasible way than enumerating all a grid of possibilities. Um, uh, dimensional analysis is, is another technique and then sort of techniques for, for thoughtfully finding combinations. And I'm not going to dwell on this too heavily, but I want you to know that these are, are possibilities. And I'm not going to, you know, uh, in any way require strong knowledge of this, but it is, um, it is good to know that options exist and that if pursued, you could use them artfully. And the first of these is a little bit um, distinguished because it actually cuts across many areas of modeling. And, and it's, it's an area of, of work with models to which I've contributed, um, but it really goes back centuries um, to the practice enshrined in the physical sciences, notably in physics, sometimes wielded with remarkable, astonishing virtuosity to, to glean understanding from mathematical models by according the pieces of that model with annotated information on their dimensions. Now, those in the audience um, are from a variety of backgrounds. And some of you from the life sciences might not be quite as familiar with this, uh, or some from the health sciences, um, but certainly in the natural sciences. And, and I think this is probably true somewhat in, in chemistry and, and, and uh, biology. Um, there's routinely um, a, a reflection on units and dimensions with which we measure things. Um, certainly this is widely seen in chemistry with, you know, where you're dealing with molalities versus molarities of things. You're dealing with concentrations versus absolute amounts. You're dealing with interpreting uh, titers um, where, you know, there's a certain amount of, of dilution needed uh, um, or, or a certain amount of dilution um, neutralization will still occur, assay results, et cetera. Um, and, and dimensional analysis, it turns out, is one of these best practices for modeling that is, um, that is incompletely practiced but strongly recommended. The idea is when you're building a model, and it doesn't matter if it's an agent-based model, a system dynamics model, a discrete event simulation model, just as a chemist would be clear about the units with which some things are measured, 
in their in the numbers they record from an experiment. You know whether it's measured in in milliliters or or in uh, or in in you know grams or or or, or um, kilograms or pounds of something. You know you're going to want to keep track of units or dimension. And uh, in physics, this is even more basic because uh, you're dealing with, you know, areas on the one hand or volumes on the other or linear lengths on the other or units of time on the other, um, concentrations um, uh, in different cases. And, and in our models, in our simulation models, it turns out many of our quantities have dimension, but they are not always dimensions of area and linear volume uh, and, and you know, uh, volumes of, of, of liquid or something. Often they are things like cone of people or dollars or time or people per unit time, et cetera. Um, so, you know, the idea with dimensional analysis and sensitivity analysis is that if you really understand the structure of a model, often it isn't one parameter in isolation that's the relevant unit of analysis. It's not the number of people in the population, perhaps, but the density of people over the landscape that matters. So it's people per unit area. That's really the operative one. We may say the the number of infected, you know, rises uh, steeply with with the number of people in the population. But a lot of that much might just be due to the density of people, the fact they're more more tightly packed, right? Um, uh, perhaps it's not a matter of, you know, bottlenecks occur when there's too few healthcare workers. Um, maybe it's not the number of healthcare workers per se. That's the determining factor in wait times. Maybe it's healthcare worker per person who comes in for care. It's a ratio of two things, not, not just one thing in isolation. So, you know, often we have in our models several, a variety of, of parameters. And, and what dimensional analysis shows, and it's a deep subject to which a whole a whole course could be offered just on this. And there are courses offered at um, traditionally within some natural sciences. But, um, but I will say that sometimes it's the ratio of things that matter for certain things, that that's the operative quantity that's of interest, not just the value by itself. And sometimes it's the multiplication of two parameters. So imagine you have an SIR model in, in classic SIR. Well, gosh, we could, we could go, um, let, let's go illustrate this. Man, um, so I'm going to go to any logic here, and I'm going to call up a model. I'm going to call up an example model. Um, and we're going we're gonna to open up. Uh, one of the first models we saw in this class. It's called uh, SIR. Uh, and oh, you know what? Well, I this I remember there's a version of it posted on the website for PLE. It's the very first model I posted for this class. You can see it there. SIR agent based for PLE. Let's go download that, and we'll sidestep some issues. Okay. Okay, so there we are. We're going to download it. We're going to go load it in. Okay. Um, and uh, this model, you know what? I just realized uh, I could illustrate it with that, but it's going to be more compelling. I'm sorry, folks. Let's go to this SAR agent based calibration. This is actually going to be more helpful. I apologize. Um, there's some things in one model and some things in the other. This is the one we want. So it is the help model um, in any logic help. Apologies for the confusion. SIR agent-based calibration uh, available off of help. 
again, example models, scroll down on the right, SAR agent based calibration. Okay, let's go load that in. Here we go. And um, this, this is a model which is designed to illustrate calibration, but it's designed in a little bit of a, uh, of a way I find a bit contrived, actually. So here with the calibration process, we're trying to vary two parameters, contact rate and infection probability. And we're trying to estimate their values independently. So we're trying to tweak them and find the best combination of them, contact rate infection probability, the best to explain the observed data. And we're going to come back to this. We'll come back to this very model, but we'll come back to more compelling models. But let's go, let's go look at the model here, if we could. So here's a model. Um, and uh, we're going to, um, I, I would note that we have this contact rate and infection probability here. And if we go look at the contact rate, um, where are the contacts occurring? Double click on person here. Uh, and you could see contacts are occurring within the infectious state. With, when people are infective, they have contact with others, right? And what is their rate of contact? Their rate of contact is contact rate times infection probability. So we could calibrate contact rate and infection probability and arrive at an understanding of the best combination of them. But it's a bit contrived because it's really the product of these that matters. I mean, the end, the model itself doesn't care independently about the contact rate, right? It doesn't care independently about the infection probability. It cares about the, 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 the product of these. It's completely blind to what the contact rate is as long as this product is the same. It's completely blind what the infection probability is to this product. The only way it knows about, the only way contact rate has an effect in this model is through this, through this product. This product factorizes it, to speak in categorical terms, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go that direction. So here it's this product that's the operative thing. This is the, the appropriate sort of quantity by which to explain the operation of the model. We could talk about calibrating each, you know, getting the best value for, for contact rate and, and, and infection probability together, but it's, you know, any value where this product is maintained is going to give an equally good fit because the model doesn't know about contact rate except through this. And there's a lot of situations in our model where, where our model ling, where this is true. And I might know the same thing is true when we have a, uh, an aggregate uh, model um, as formulated classically in SIR form, because there, the, the classic form of that model uh, would have content. The, the number of new people being infected over time would be a contact rate. So it'd be the number of susceptible people times the force of infection. The force of infection is given by the contact rate times the fraction of people in the infect uh, in the population who are infective, the whole population. So I over N, if you want to think about it that way, times beta, where beta is the per discordant contact transmission probability. You're both susceptible and infected together. What's the probability of transmission? It's basically C times beta there, just like this. You rearrange it and you get C times beta. That's all it cares about is C beta. It doesn't care about C independently of beta. It's C beta that's the operative term. It's the product of those. It doesn't know about beta except for C beta. You know? So as long as the product's the same, it's going to be the same result. And so this goes back to my point here that a lot of models, um, you know, they, their behavior, it's not that it depends on a parameter in isolation. It depends on a 
some some um, product or, or or quotient or combination of parameters mathematically that are the operative one. And dimensional analysis exploits this this factor. Basically, uh, it turns out, and it's a deep fact, that the world doesn't care what dimensions we use. And, and you know, we can use imperial system, uh, you know, inches, feet, yards, um, and we could use that as our unit system, or we could use the metric system, meters, and you know, the system international, the, the you know, meters and centimeters and and uh, and microns, microns, etc. It doesn't matter. The world's not going to change because of that. Like the the processes in the world are not going to change. And it turns out that you can use that to prove the fact that the world must only depend the world's dynamics whatever dynamics govern the world out there there can be all sorts of uncertainties about those dynamics but one thing we know for sure is they can't care about our units and it turns out that means they can only depend on dimensionless quantities quantities which are of unit dimension where the dimensions don't matter for that quantity and you can do amazing things with this fact. You can rule out certain ways of describing the world, certain processes, certain models that don't make sense. And I don't care if it's statistical models or mechanistic models, agent-based models, system dynamics models, discrete event simulation. They're, if they're not dimensionally consistent, they're not going to be an adequate characterization of the world. They're not going to be plausible characterization of the world because their outputs um, would posit a world that is that is unit dependent. Um, and this is a deep fact and it can rule out broad ranges of formulation. And in fact, you'll find physicists who have done amazing things with this. There's a, there's a famous case of Robert Oppenheimer who observing at Trinity site in New Mexico, the explosion of the first atomic bomb, dropped some pieces of paper into the wind, observed how far they flew, and, uh, and did a calculation of the power of the bomb. Or another physicist from UK who looked at the pictures of that explosion and from dimensional analysis quantities, figured out how powerful the bomb was based on what he observed in those pictures. So. This is, this is deep stuff, but at the end of the day, it turns out what this means is that if you are savvy about your dimensions, if you are savvy about keeping track of your dimensions, you can figure out ways to formulate your model with fewer parameters. You can figure out what the operative parameters. And instead of doing sensitivity analysis on beta and C separately, you do it on beta C is one thing. It's just beta C. That's all the model. You combine them. You call them beta C. That's the name, beta C. And it's just one thing. You combine them into one parameter and you have one fewer parameter to calibrate. You have one fewer parameter to, to perform sensitivity analysis on. Instead of two, you have one. But this may sound like small potatoes, but in a model which has a bunch of dimensions, time, dollars, people, doses of vaccine, what have you, um, you might be able to shave two parameters off. In some cases, three parameters off your parameter count. And you get to the essential parameters instead of the inessential ones. You're, you're kind of working with the nub of the issue. You recognize the density of the population is the operative thing here. Um, uh, or, you know, it's the um, kind of the infectiousness, B C, uh, C, C beta, contact rate times, pro infection transmission probability, then either of them 
and you get away from inessentials. Um, so you can reduce the parameter count here. Um, and, and I will say that as a general practice, agent-based modelers, uh, in a way that is astounding to me, given its roots in physics, um, among physicists, um, in addition to computer scientists, agent-based modeling has rarely taken advantage of dimensional annotation. By contrast, in system dynamics modeling, dimensional annotation is quite common, um, far from universal, but it's very common. Um, and, and it's with good reason. So you will find um, lectures uh, from me um, in, some, in some occurrences of modeling courses I've given three lectures, maybe four on using dimensional analysis. It turns out that what's really interesting is it's not terribly hard to assign par parameters and model quantities uh, dimensions um, with some exceptions. And, and uh, I won't get into them here, things involving networks, et cetera. But it's also not hard to perform dimensional analysis on those models. It's also a turn the crank sort of thing once you know how to do it. So if anyone's interested in dialoguing about this, this happens to be a personal passion of mine and it tends to be really underserved in nature-based modeling for reasons that I cannot fully fathom, except that too much of agent-based modeling has traditionally been performed by hackers. Um, okay. Um, okay, so uh, another option for reducing parameter space or for reducing the burden associated with the explosion of possibilities we get with, with doing sensitive analysis with large numbers of parameters is techniques for judiciously um, identifying combinations. I'm not going to go into this as much detail here because we're going to be coming to model calibration shortly. And really, these techniques, all three of them, but particularly the second one, I'm going to talk about more because there you are often having a real premium on um, keeping it fewer parameters or carefully selecting your parameters for calibration. I'm going to give you a, a kind of sneak preview of, of what that looks like. And uh, there are a set of folks who have used these techniques for calibration or for sensitivity analysis. Um, and uh, you'll find certain terms of art in this area. One is called Latin hypercubes. And the idea here is, is a simple one. Um, for sensitivity analysis, you want to be you want to be sure that you haven't left out entirely in your sensitivity analysis, neglected entirely some broad possibility. Um, you want to, look, you, you might not do all combinations, but you want to do at least one of each possible, say, discrete value of a parameter. You know, maybe you're, maybe the parameter relates to who's the focus of the intervention. Uh, High income groups, medium income groups, or low income groups, something like that. Um, and and you have lots of other parameters you're dealing with, but you you need to do at least one simulation is the idea with a low low income group, at least one with a high, at least one with a a medium one. So give it each possible value of a parameter p. I'm referring to it as if it's discrete, as if it holds discrete possible values, high, medium, low income. But if this is continuous, the possible values are like ranges of values, like between zero and 0 0.1, and 0 0.1 and 0 0.2, and 0.2 and 0.3. So for each possible value, we're guaranteed to have explored at least one case where, where we have that. Right? Um, the idea is we don't want to, like in thinning down the set of possibilities, we don't want to neglect at least one examination. Uh, we want to make sure the model doesn't blow up, doesn't cause 
bizarre things when it's undertaken with the intervention is occurring in high income groups, even if our focus is more on low income groups or what. So, so here we, the idea is you thin out the possible things you're examining as long as you're examining at least one, one time possible value. So for contact rate, you do at least one between zero and point 0.1. Um, even if you're not examining all possible combinations of that with everything else. The orthogonal arrays idea takes this further. And this is a technique that comes out that's widely used in, um, in some other spheres. It, one of the areas that it does see use is, um, is testing, um, uh, testing of software programs. And here, you're not guaranteeing that each parameter has at least each of its possible values tried at least once. You're making sure each pair of possible values across different parameters, parameter A, parameter B, parameter A and parameter C, parameter A and parameter D, that each possible value uh, of each of them, each pair of possible values has been tried at least once. But you're not guaranteeing that all combinations of parameters have been tried. Um, anyway, um, so I, I'm going to, to go light on that. Um, so, so you can have these uses of Latin hypercubes and orthogonal rays people have, have used. And this is a technique, I think particularly in industrial engineering and discrete event simulation, this has been applied quite strongly to look at kind of a thorough, thorough enough exploration of space. Um, and, uh, you know, using Latin hypercubes to be, to be uh, at least not to pass the red phase test. Make sure you ex examined plausibly at least one of each possible value or each possible kind of uh, range uh, of values for a given um, a given parameter. Uh, the final technique I'll come back to is Monte Carlo techniques. And Monte Carlo techniques um, are a conceptually simple idea with deep implications. So here, as we saw last time, we're feeding, we're, we're drawing parameters from probability distribution to reflect our uncertainty about these. We saw this last time, and I'm, I'm gonna try. I didn't plan this out, but I'm gonna try to call that up right now. So last time we were examining two models. One was this multi-clinic SIS hybrid which had this razor thin sort of um, um, uh, tipping point associated with it. Certain values of a parameter, uh, if, it were, if it were much lower than that, you'd see almost no change over wide varieties. But at that point, things would go critical. There'd be a phase change, a phase transition, fittingly enough. And it would totally change. Physicists love these sort of things. Physicists deal with order parameters for phase transitions in, you know, solid to, to liquid or liquid to gas or what have you. And they're very interested often in the, the uh, what's going on at those phase transitions. Um, but here, last time, we, um, we saw that we could draw these from a grid here or from you know from each via parameter sweep but we also drew this value for contacts per day from an from a truncated normal distance right so we saw last time hmm. seems like a basic idea if we draw it once we'll get one value draw it again get another value draw it third time get another value and you know, it's worth reflecting that we could have done the same thing for the incubation period, for the day, duration of infectivity, right? Um, for the probability of success. We could draw each of them from its own probability distribution or draw them from a joint probability distribution. Probability distribution that 
gives a probability of having these parameters together, these particular values, these parameters together. And that may seem like kind of a weak medicine in the sense of, well, you're drawing these. I mean, aren't you, aren't you sort of throwing away intelligence? I'm, I'm trying to trying to kind of um give a give a plausible face to why someone might think this is crazy. You're just rolling dice when you should think, right? You know, like why don't we be intelligent and and systematic and you know and and very deliberate in our sampling? Why don't we go in something like a grid? Why are we drawing from a distribution? I mean, you're just playing games, right? You're you're just rolling the dice when you should be thinking and doing and exploring it systematically. And it's easy to think that way. It's easy to think that way that, you know, you're just taking the easy way out by drawing up from a, from a, from a distribution. And I beg to differ with this. Um, and I beg to differ for two reasons. And many of you will have anticipated one, maybe some will have anticipated both. One, one of these reasons is that this distribution may capture in some sense of a, a prior probability distribution in your mind. You, you know, you think it's roughly um, in the area of a mean of one and a, and it's it's kind of much more likely to be around one and much less, less, less likely to be further away from that. So you draw it from plausible parameter values instead of sort of mechanically sweeping across a broad grid. You spend more time in the areas that you think are more plausible and it induces a, a distribution for the output, which is kind of nice to nice to think about. You know, you have kind of a prior distribution and then there's this, this outcome from the model, right? It's not a posterior, it's not a distribution for this parameter, but it's it's an outcome from the model that's induced by this distribution. So you know, often these distributions capture our kind of sense of what's more plausible. And and as such, they're rather nice and often more effective than just sweeping over a, a space. But it turns out there's a deeper issue. And it has to do with the curse of dimensionality. And um uh, some of you, many of you are from mathematics back. So I'll just note that, you know, uh, with the early work of, of uh, Newton and Leibniz and, um, and then subsequent work of, of others for numerical integration, like Leonhard Euler, um, techniques were built up for integration of numerical systems. And I know for some of you, these terms won't be meaningful, but for others, they will. Numerically integrating an ordinary differential equation in time, we have what's called Euler's method, which involves having rectangles, and we figure out the area of the rectangles, right? And we add them up um, over each little point in space where the height of the rectangle is given by the value of the function, and we figure out the area of that rectangle as a small width dt at a certain height given by that function. We add it up and we add it up and we add it up. And there's more refined methods of tri with triangles there, but, but the basic deal is we go through and systematically and with a fixed spacing, add things up. So we have Euler's method with fixed space, which is the most common and basic and widely used method for for integrating system dynamics models, for example. Um, very tried and true method. But one of the things that was discovered much later was that if you have a multi-dimensional surface, if you want to integrate multiple dimensions, maybe it's two dimensions, you have kind of a surface like mountains in some areas, valleys and others, and you want to, you want to kind of total up the area under that landscape from a base of Below sea level or what have you. Or maybe it's a three dimensional volume of space or what have you, or this complex shape. Um, as the number of dimensions goes up, this method of systematically mapping it out grid point by grid point it becomes super inefficient. And it's much more effective to numerically integrate it 
using randomness. And these are called Monte Carlo integration strategies. And you draw, you draw from random points and, and you end up integrating them. And it turns out it's to address the curse of dimensionality. It turns out that scales much more effective. Um, and uh, and so we end up having a a far far more favorable um, accuracy of integration where you draw randomly from a distribution. You know, you may wonder why I'm talking about numerical quadrature and integration. Of, of, of equations, of, of, of functions, uh, uh, but I, I'm trying to I'm trying to indicate here that actually we've learned in algorithms in mathematics that randomness isn't the easy way out. It's not the dumb way. It's not replacing intelligence by you know simple blind random rolling of the dice. Actually, it captures some broad features. And, and it turns out that Monte Carlo techniques, these techniques of drawing things from parameter values, they tend to be much more effective than multivariate systematic techniques as the number of dimensions go up. Um, and uh, this is true for sensitivity analysis, and it's true for integration. Um, and if I could put it very crudely, with uh, with um, techniques drawing from a distribution, you tend to spend more time your possible areas of the space where it really matters for numerical integration, where it matters for sensitivity analysis, instead of uh, areas of the space which are um, further out and, and often of less central interest. Um, and it turns out. Um, for uh, for integrating functions in, in multi-dimensional space that leads to much greater accuracy, much greater accuracy. It turns out that in computer science, there's all these algorithms. This was happening when I was in grad school at MIT in the lab for computer science, and there were there was a lot of fascination with it. Why randomized algorithms could perform much better. In, in certain cases than cleverly chosen, judiciously honed strategies for preferring, performing the same integration. It turns out that rolling the dice often perform better. Um, and uh, you know, for numerical integration, um, it performs more accurately for sensitivity analysis. It turns out it allows us to if we can't do super, super thorough uh, exploration of a space, we're often better off just drawing the parameters from a distribution um, that's thoughtfully chosen and in using that to perform our simulation of the model. Um, drawing values from these distributions for large numbers of parameters and sensitivity analysis will often be a more effective method than having a very coarse grid that we need to sort of step through in parameter sweeps. Um, so somewhat hand wavy here, but um, it's a very practical technique, very, very readily, um, very readily accessed. Okay, time is moving on. So I just wanna um, talk a little bit about um, some issues of, Kind of visualization of results. I mean, we we saw within our model output some way of visualizing the results. This was one way. Um, you know, examining different possible parameter values and seeing how it changes, like the the um, resulting curve, the trajectory, reflecting on the fact that not only do we have some that are sort of variations on a theme up here. But we also have some which never take off down here or stay low all throughout it, right? Um, but we've seen other techniques too for summarizing. So if we go back uh, to our um, parameter variation here and we 
you may recall that with our stochastic sensitivity, we, uh, we ended up performing a sensitivity analysis where we summarized, you know, sort of the induced distributions here uh, across these different quantities, where we were summarizing them for different runs of the model. Over the entire period of the model, what was the number of average illness counts, the number of average presentation counts, average clinic utilization? You know, these, these are things uh, that we can look at as induced distribution from stochastics alone. So now let's look at this for when we have sensitivity analysis. So here we are. Um, I'm going to kill that model. And here we have contacts per day varying. You may remember it was contacts per day. This is where we, uh, we were seeing this. And I think I may have um, uh, left it in this state of performing a lot more realizations. Um, uh, but here we have three plots. One is, is a kind of similar one to what we just saw. It summarizes across different runs you know, what fraction of, 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 the, of the runs had average illness counts in this, uh, in this sort of block or in larger blocks. So far, it's running them with sort of lower values of this. Soon enough, because it's running each one many, many times, soon enough, you'll start to see uh, a variety of different outcomes in average illness count as we start to explore this parameter space more. So here we have an outcome from the model, average illness, uh, average illness count across the population, the number of average illnesses each population member had uh, over the entire simulation. And we could see there are some simulations here um, that result from presumably many results from low parameter values down here and some from high. Um, but we, we also have the luxury with these of showing kind of marginal maps, as it were, and I'm speaking the language of statistics there. So here we have um, the parameter value, contact rate per day that we are simulating. And we are saying as it varies, what is the impact on the average presentation count or the average illness uh, uh, the average uh, number of, of, of illnesses each person has. And then down here, further down, we have average clinic utilization. Um, and in both cases, what we see is, you know, for low values of the parameter, um, very consistently low elasticity, low changes in the results as you change this parameter. And high ones, you see quite high results. Um, and there's this kind of knife edge right around one. We saw this last time. But I want to highlight the fact that we're doing this against the marginal distribution. It's just one parameter, right? Now, if we start to layer two parameters on, we'd have challenges with this because, you know, it wouldn't be so easy for us to draw a plot in two dimensions where each one showed the outcomes. What we might do is have a two-dimensional plot. For example, on the x-axis, we might have contact rate. The y-axis, we might have incubation time. And then it might be a heat map. So it would show with color how far out it comes. Right? Um, or maybe we would, we would have a 3D plot, as is you know, routinely created in R these days, right? Where we could rotate it around and see in 3D as we change contact rate and, you know, incubation time, what is the level of presentation counter illness duration? As you can imagine, as you start getting up to larger numbers of parameters, you start varying larger numbers of parameters, it can become challenging to see this and you end up often projecting it down to one dimension, just, you know, essentially saying for any run with one contact rate of one, 
you know, the incubation time could be whatever will summarize the average for those or something like that. Um, you can do 3D okay. Um, we have some compelling work that's taken place in this room. Wade, Wade has been there with the Oculus using 3D visualizations, which are pretty cool. Um, uh, in, in 3D, and you can rotate it around and, and see it. And potentially you could do something in 4D with, with color and, uh, and maybe even 5D with color and time. But, you know, as you start getting higher dimensions, this starts to get more tricky. You can still do, you know, a, a summary overall without paying attention to what led to what, but it, it gives you a sense of how much variability there was, but not why, where, not where it came from, from what particular parameters induced this. But, you know, with a bit more work and with tools of data science, you could, you know, have some way of interrogating this bar up here and this bar, what were the average values of, you know, contacts per day for them compared to this one and, and start to kind of explore that. We're getting into issues here of visualization. And if I have my druthers before this course ends, I'll have a lecture on visualization with agent-based models. But suffice it to say that sensitivity analysis does get us into the realm of a visualization at times um, to really adequately visualize the results of a model. But let's go back to, to this. Um, partly for, for this reason we've been talking about, you know, you can use these tools for visualization to when you're dealing with more than one parameter. And and I I'm really am showing here a spider plot. This is not specific to to sensitive analysis, but the idea is if you had a set of variables, parameters with which you were performing sensitive analysis around the outside of this anhedron, polyhedron. Um, so maybe HR is one parameter, communication is another, risk is another procurement. Um, for example, um, you could uh, and uh, you could examine, uh, you know, how does each of those end up affecting? Uh, to what degree is it sensitive? A certain outcome sensitive, and you could use it. Um, you know, the, the uh, lengths along this bar to indicate the sensitivity with respect to that parameter. Alternatively, these could be outcome measures. And as you change one parameter, you could ask how much does changing that parameter affect this outcome versus that outcome versus that outcome versus that, which is more what this had in mind. So spider plots are one of these plots that can be used when there's many outcomes or many um, uh, many possible inputs. And of course, you could you could also use diagrams in multiple dimensions to show, you know, as you vary one set of parameters over different values, subdividing this here um, and and change other things. How does it affect um, how does it affect different possible outcomes shown in and uh, excuse me, this is like changing relapse rates or changing cessation rates or changing uh, uptake rates. How does, it, how does it affect the quality adjusted life you have saved, for example, over that space? Um, okay, um, yeah. again, with an eye towards time. Um, another, another issue that does come up in dynamic modeling in general and agent-based models in particular is sensitivity to initial state of the model. And here, you know, often it reflects the fact we rarely know the initial state of a system. And, um, you know, a, a useful type of sensitive analysis is often to vary the initial state. Now, sometimes people get really caught up in initial states. There are many models where the initial state tends to get washed out over time. And for those, we often, when there's, when we're more interested in understanding the broad outcomes of a model for different assumptions, we'll often perform what's called a burn-in period. So you run it for a certain period of time, you get the model in a kind of balanced state. And in, in system dynamics, this is often called equilibration. 
So you sort of equilibrate this model. You get it in a balanced state where the dynamics are not merely the results of the system starting out of balance. Um, and then following that, having gotten in this, this balanced state, then you run it with different interventions, different scenarios. And you're confident that the dynamics observed are not the results of the vagaries of what state it started in, the fact that state wasn't carefully matched to the dynamics. Because over time, ladies and gentlemen, the dynamics observed in a model is generally driven by the change based on the, the current state. And you know, if, um, if the initial state is starting with a distribution of people in different health states that's inconsistent with the um, kind of the rules of, of, of the likelihoods of different eventualities, you'll get a lot of change early on that it's just because it, again, it started out of balance. It wasn't in whack with, it wasn't, it wasn't consistent with um, the, the sort of dynamic seeming model. Um, uh, so sometimes we run a burn-in period, um, uh, but, <laughs> You know, some people do perform sensitivity analyses to capture um, outcomes of different states if your focus is really in a, in a certain historic period where it really matters. Um, okay, so a few reflections here. Firstly, in stochastic models, for each combination of parameters, there's some variability, right? Like you assign fixed parameters. We saw that in our very first stochastic sensitivity right here. Um, uh, the stochastic sensitivity. We saw for fixed values of parameters, these are, these are fixed parameter values here, nothing changing. And yet as we run this, there's variability in outcome, right? Not surprising, it's stochastic. There, there's going to be different outcomes. Um, these could be affected by some things other than stochastics for some models, like the vagaries of the network it's imposed at the start of the time, for example. But broadly, we expect different outcomes. So just, just remember that it's not when we think about model outcomes in HMS modeling that are different, it's not merely a function of parameters. Um, for intervention-oriented models, and that's really our a lot of our next uh, lecture here. Um, uh, often we we care about interventions that really affect the ordering between policies. Which policy looks best? And um, and as I emphasized late last time, you know you may have. Outcomes of the model be very contingent on parameters, but relative desirability of interventions not being contingent, not not really varying hugely. Um, and uh, I I noted that when we go to calibration, we'll come back to this issue of how it relates to sensitivity analysis. I was going to speak here about non-parametric tests that we often use, the Kolmogorov, Smirnoff test, the Kretzko-Wallace um, uh, test, Man Whitney U test. Um, but um, I think I will save that to the discussion of the interventions uh, because often it, it comes in there. And I'm going to therefore um, give a bit of a of a teaser to that. I, I think it really fits well there because we're trying to often assess is one intervention better than another. We might pursue that through a man Whitney one way U test, or Wilcoxon rank some test, in other words, uh, or a Wilcoxon test if we have more than two um, in order to assess is this better than that, even though both are very variable, even though both have distributions that may have overlap. So what we're going to be going on to is to discuss counterfactual scenarios. And we're going to be discussing this issue of use of scenarios with models. I don't think I've given a talk on this with interface modeling before, with 
dynamic modeling in general. And, you know, it struck me that we really need to discuss it because often it's central to our model. Often our model is accompanied by, it is made valuable by. This, it, it's accompanied by a set of scenarios. What makes our model valuable is often not merely the model logic, but the scenarios that accompany it and exercise that logic for particular questions, to investigate particular questions. And it is a routine matter and a matter of great significance and practical utility and, and, and widespread character that we accompany a model by structures that are um, uh, they're, they're notable for, for the structure they, they have. We have baseline scenario. We have what if scenarios, some of which are interventions. And for intervention scenarios, particularly for agent-based models, we have a particularly rich uh, smorgasbord, a particularly rich set of options, some involving static interventions, some involving dynamic interventions. Um, and uh, we're going to, to see those. Um, so um, here we're going to, and, and um, I'm not sure we'll, we'll pull this up, but we're going to talk about how we accompany models with scenarios. And each scenario is going to involve running the model with different particular assumptions, uh, particularly about uh, parameters, but sometimes about logic, sometimes about the logic that's used in the context, particularly of intervention. Um, and uh, often we will have what if scenarios that are delineated by into two groups, one that are things under our control and then a set of things not under our control. So this should be what if scenarios here. And I apologize um, for omitting that. Um, so there are some where we might be interested in how will the system we're dealing with deal with various exogenous factors, various shocks, various occurrences that are not under our control. You know, a worsening unemployment rate or a, um, a, a deepening recession or a presence of a new highly vaccine resistant variant um, uh, or, a, uh, or a confluence of, uh, of, of two different bugs um, and nearby um, that, are, that are both very serious and, and testing the system. These are things not under control, but we're interested in how it responds to that. Um, and then there might be things possibly under control that represent intervention strategies. And so commonly what happens is we have a baseline scenario and, and we run the model for that, which is often kind of our status quo or business as usual or familiar scenario with familiar texture. And then we run these what if scenarios against it using the baseline as a point of reference, using the baseline as a common reference. And we compare outcomes against that common reference point so that we can assess the impacts of the specific differences we imposed for these what if scenarios. Because we have something that represents the model outcomes without those differences, and then we have it with those differences. Um, the baseline sometimes is kind of the default to some terms in the model, but in any case, it serves as a reference against which, uh, on which these, what from which these what if scenarios are derived um, with, with changes and then against which we, we compare. So, so let's take a look at those models in our in final moments here. So if we go up, we can close this agent-based calibration model. I made the point there with uh, dimensionality. I'm gonna ask you to, uh, well, we have some models open. I think maybe next time we'll, focus more on this introductory teaching GDM, but we already have multi-clinic. So you'll notice here we have a baseline scenario. Um, and then 
we have a set of alternative scenarios. We say, suppose we had a, a scenario where we had a high illness uh, hazard rate, but we had three clinics, for example, or we had two clinics uh, in place. And the baseline, we only have one clinic in place. And here we're comparing with three clinics and two clinics uh, against the, the baseline. And really our comparison here should only be changing a single parameter because we want to understand how that effect you know, would, would impact it. And here you might view these as interventions. We put in place you know, clinic. Other scenarios though might look at the impact of assuming, for example, um, uh, a uh, longer duration of infectivity um, or a um, uh, a uh, kind of fewer well, healthcare workers per clinic might be an intervention as well. Um, uh, a larger uh, number who are uh, initially infected, for example. And we we might we might examine the model with those different scenarios. You could view those as sensitivity analyses or what if scenarios, but they will be compared in their results to the baseline scenario. So this is a model with a set of interventions um, uh, associated with clinics, a set of other scenarios, um, say that the presence of a high illness hazard rate compared to the baseline. And in general, this, this is you know, a frequent occurrence with our models. We will have baseline and a set of alternatives to baseline whose parameters are the baselines except for certain surgical changes. And by comparing the two, we see the results of each we, to each other, we, we see the effects of those changes. So we're gonna be talking about this more next time because in agent-based modeling, we have some added texture. Um, and uh, specifically, um, we can have in place mechanisms to have dynamics uh, uh, in scenarios which are dynamics of interventions, for example. Um, and uh, here we, we can ask, um, ask about interventions that are not merely fixed in their, in their um, definition over time, but might involve responding to changes observed in the model dynamics over time and different uh, interventions are undertaken in, in those outcomes. Okay, um, so that's all we have time for today. We're gonna return to this issue of scenarios. And we're gonna talk about how also agent-based modeling can only allow us more flexible definition of scenarios, more detailed scenarios, but it can also allow us to characterize implementation science effects. And we'll be looking at a model where we characterize not just the dynamics of the population, but the dynamics of our interventions. So how the interventions play out over time, the resources needed for them, how that how those resources are simulated, the availability, the buildup of those resources are simulated in the model so that we can look at the outcomes um, over time as a result of that. Okay, so that's all we have time for today. As I noted at the beginning of class, we're gonna hold office hours today, but it'll be one hour later. So I'll meet with Maurice here uh, for the next hour and, uh, and then uh, I'll reconvene for office hours um, in another hour's time. So I'll look forward to anyone who'd like to join for office hours uh, in an hour from now. Thank you very much. And I hope to see many of you there. Take care.